Hello, and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. It's been a while since I did a movie review. So, well, the Kawhi Dan review I did went over very well, and I feel like continuing with the samurai film tack, so let's take a look at the movie Sword of the Beast. Sword of the Beast stars Mikijiro Hara as Ginosuke, a samurai who was cast out of his clan for having murdered a high-ranking counselor and is now on the run. Pursuing him is the counselor's daughter, Misa, played by Toshii Kimura, and her fiancé, Daizaboro, played by Kantaro Suga, who are seeking revenge, and due to various structures of the clan system, cannot return to the clan until Genosuke is killed. While fleeing, Genosuke also encounters a farmer named Gundayu, played by Takeshi Kato. Realizing that Genosuke is a fugitive, Gundayu enlists him in his cunning plan to poach gold from a mountain owned by the Shogun. As Genosuke could do with the money to fund his flight, he agrees to take part in this plan. So I have a question. This f the film sets up that the gold on the mountain is owned by the shogunate, and stealing, well, basically panning for gold on the mountain, prospecting is poaching from the shogunate, and it's kind of implied that, well, doing this any other mountain that has gold is prospecting from the shogunate and, and poaching from them, and thus get you the death penalty. It makes sense. At this point in feudal Japan, the shogunate also had a monopoly on foreign trade, and this related to their closed, basically their closed country policy when it comes to foreign trade, with like Western powers only being able to ha operate one factory in well, not Nagasaki, but yeah, there was like one Dutch factory operating in Japan, and all point trade with China went through. Uh, Nagasaki and similar sorts of things. So I understand that. That makes perfect sense considering my knowledge, based on my knowledge of Japanese society from the time and the shogunate's basically solidifying all the power, solidifying power in itself to prevent any one clan or whatever from becoming a major rival for power. I get that. That makes total perfect sense. I completely understand it. But this leads to the film's plot hole. If the shogunate has a monopoly on gold mining and prospecting. Wouldn't just the simple act of having gold dust on you, even if you're like well away from any mountain or anywhere else, signify that you were in fact, had in fact been poaching from the shogunate and thus potentially put you at risk under the law, possibly even leading to you getting killed? Because Theoretically, any shogunate would, any gold dust would have to go through the shogun, shogunate, and be converted into currency before being put into distribution. That seems weird. That that, as far as like, oh, I'm going to go poach gold from this mountain. It, it seems like the dumbest possible thing to do because the moment you try to, to turn that gold dust into money, you run into problems. Anyway, Genosuke and Gundayu aren't the only people engaging in poaching on the mountain. Jurata Yamane played by Gokato, and his wife Taka, played by Shima Iwashita, are also on the mountain. They, however, are poaching on the orders of their clan, which is tight for cash. As with all secret missions, though, the usual disclaimer applies. As always, should you or any member of your IM force be caught or killed, the secretary will disavow any knowledge of your actions. While Jirota and Taka sit about in their poaching, the marriage of the two is strained, as Jirota wants to prove himself to his clan, while Taka is worried about the penalty if they're captured. Further, Misa and Daizaburo are still on the hunt for Genosuke, and they're getting closer. While Genosuke is on the man mountain, we are also introduced to another group of characters, some bandits, who are out to either do some poaching for themselves, or, if the opportunity comes becomes available, to ambush and kill some other poachers and take their gold and save themselves some hard labor. During this portion of the film, in flashback, we also learn Genosuke's somewhat tragic back backstory. It turns out that he was duped by another clan member in killing the counselor with promises that if the counselor were to die, 
then this new clan then this other clan member would reform the clan and change it so advancement was based on merit and thus Ginosuke would be able to advance within the clan this was of course all lies this was done so that the person doing the killing could advance at which point he would then turn on Genosuke and betray him to ultimately death and thus Genosuke was forced to go on the run based on well getting screwed this all comes to a head when Genosuke learns that Jirata's clan plans to betray him in a similar fashion to how he was betrayed and that once they deliver the gold to their clan members then Jirata and Taka will be killed by the clan. So Genosuke decides to throw in with Jirata and try to save him from his own clan, and thus theoretically save him from this fate that he's stuck with, more or less. Um, unfortunately, Genosuke shows up too late, and Jirata and Misa are killed. So Genosuke takes on the clan members in a very impressive battle, and ultimately overcomes them. Meanwhile, Daisaburo and Misa end up encountering the bandits, and, well, they're, they're separated, and Misa is raped. Genosuke comes across Misa and her attackers and kills the bandits handily. Afterwards, the two realize, basically, that the clan system has, betra has betrayed them all. Under the code of laws of Fuel Japan at this time, women who were raped could not return home to their clans, which means even if Misa and Daisaburo got their revenge, if they killed Genosuke right there, they would never be able to return home. And thus recognizing the hypocrisy of the clan system, the two, well, sort of three, go their separate ways, and the film ends. So... This film is in the Criterion Collection for a very good reason. It is an excellent film. The performances of the various, of the actors in this movie for the characters are very well done. The story is well written. And it features some themes like betrayal and the corruption inside the uh, feudal clan system that director and writer Hideo Gosha would, and I apologize for mispronouncing his name, would revisit in his later work, which hopefully I will get to at some point. Um... This film is, in addition to being on DVD and being able to purchase as part of the Criterion Collection, is also available from streaming for streaming on Hulu, which means there's really no good reason for you not to see this unless you're not in the United States and can't watch Hulu, or at least can't watch Criterion Collection's programming on Hulu. If you're a fan of samurai films, particularly in the Jedi Geki genre, this is something that really you should you should take the time to sit down and watch. If you feel that you're allergic to black and white movie, just get over it. This film is worth seeing. It's an excellent movie. Next week, though, we begin with Nintendo Power proper. With, on as my Nintendo Power recaps reach issue number one. So that's something to look forward to. And until then, I'm Count Zero. Thank you for watching.